Welcome to the Nutramedical Report, and we are joined with uh, Tim Alexander, of course, our geopolitical military analyst. Tim, what's the latest news stories you're tracking today? Uh, hi, Dr. Bell. Well, uh, I'm looking at the uh, Cyprus thing. Uh, you know, uh, the globalists have been all over the place at telling uh, the poor depositors in the main banks in Cyprus how much they're going to have to pay. Uh, right. If initially they said it varied from six to ten percent, then they said fifteen percent. Now it's coming out that uh, in one of the two main banks, uh, the depositors may have to pay eighty percent. Yeah, uh, actually, Joel, we had on the other day yesterday. He said uh, the average is forty percent for some. It was up to a hundred percent for Lycos Bank for some, not just eighty percent, a hundred percent. Yeah, and yeah. Well, they, they give advance they, they notice to the Russians. Eighty percent by saying it may be a very long time before they can even get any of that. And, right, but the know, other the thing was that the Russians got a yeah. The, but the Russians got advance notice on that too. This is what's not being reported. Uh, and I've got it. By the way, I've got a film to upload to, uh, to your site uh, on this. The two main banks. Uh, when all this started, then they first came out, there was going to be a haircut. Uh, Putin, as well, well, Putin in particular, uh, came out with some very derogatory comments about what was going on and a warning. Now, those in the know know that uh, the Russian ruling class, this is where they park their money. This is their offshore banking center. And the Russian ruling class is not the uh, oligarchs that uh, robbed everything uh, because Putin threw a couple in prison and the rest fled either to Israel or to the United Kingdom. Uh, the ruling class is the ex-KGP ex-KGB people around Putin. Putin was their fair-haired boy of the oligarchs. He was the first and only head of any of the um, uh, KGB, Chekhov, uh, NKVD line of uh, secret police that wasn't uh, Jewish. And the reason he wasn't is seven, well, there were seven main oligarchs. Six out of the seven were Jewish, and they were people were pointing fingers at him. People were literally losing their entire savings in the banks, as uh, the girlfriend I had uh, after my wife died. Uh, her dad was in space program, and they lived fairly well. They lost everything. In fact, her and her mom, after her dad died, almost starved. And that was a very common event. I mean, it was really terrible. And so they brought Putin in. First, they made him head of the KGB, then deputy prime minister, and then he ended up being uh, president. He replaced Yeltsin. Yeltsin was their boy. Yeltsin was a drunk, and he did what, what they told him to do. Well, Putin was very smart and very tough. And he and some of his friends turned the tables, and they took the country back. Sent some people to prison, and the rest fled the country. And now... The politicians in Cyprus, and there's only about 60-some in their parliament, it's not a very big country, uh, and, you know, the, the cabinet ministers basically were between the biggest rock there is and one of the hardest rocks there is, rock in a hard place. The globalists, the global banking cartel, however, have been the drivers in this. And they, they're punishing and, and taking money away from the Russian elite. But the Russian elite are better than any junkyard dogs. You don't take their money, not if you want to live. They'll track you down, they'll kill you. Well, there was this strange case of the godfather of the seven oligarchs, Berlinski, who supposedly 
You talking about Berezovsky? Uh, uh, it was natural causes. Now they say, well, he Tim, hung Tim, himself. Tim, you're talking about Berezovsky that had the Berezovsky, so-called... I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah okay. uh, around, uh, scarf around his neck, but he had supposedly jumped 25 feet from the place where he supposedly hung himself and ended up in a tub. So he actually had a pirouette, a double backflip, and ended up dying in a tub 25 feet away. Which <laughs> yeah, is, right. He had to be well, a bit of acrobatic. A maybe help. He might have had a little help. Maybe, maybe. Well, what, maybe. what the little help was is this was part of the process of educating uh, those that maybe were kind of on the borderline. Who are we more scared of, the Russian mob or uh, the Rothschild uh, empire? And they said to some people, something's going to happen in the next day. And we're going to demonstrate to you that no matter how much protection or money you have, we can get to you, and we will get to you. So you will cooperate with us, and we will get our money out. Right. And then you you <clears throat> had the back flipping the uh, <laughs> the the strangest case of suicide they've ever seen, etc. Right. And uh, all of a sudden. Something happened. The banks were closed. It took a week. The parliament said, no, we're not going to give haircuts. Now they're giving haircuts again. But in that week, the banks kept their branches in Russia open. And the right Russians were able to get all their money out. Right. Now, there are three classes of people that were deposited there. Americans and foreign nationals that were depositing their money, and I actually know somebody that was stupid enough to put all their money well, into those they're banks. Toast. And they're toast. The second group were drug runners and uh, and uh, gun salesmen. <coughs> and the third group were people like the Russian Mafia, the uh, literally underground Russian party, which is the real party that runs the Soviet Union, which, by the way, never went away. So all these nations that so-called drifted off and became CIS former nations, some of them are affiliates with NATO, etc., don't believe the lie. The Soviet Union is like a Russian bear in hibernation. Russian bear wake up, Russian bear is hungry. So yeah, it, it, it's the, it, it's always been a struggle. Is who 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 controls the Russian bear? And it it, right. it moved from the the imperial family, the Romanovs, to uh, the global banking cartel people, who right. uh, used Lenin and uh, Trotsky and then Stalin to right. maintain control. To when Putin came in, they, the, the, some of Putin's people they literally turned the tables on the crowd because everything was in chaos anyway. Right. And uh, the, the, the Rothschild interests have not been comfortable with that. They don't like to be outfoxed at their own game. And they were pulling some chips in. But the Russian mob won that particular day. Well, and that's what happened. That and the media will never tell you the real story about what happened. Now, no, no, there's, a de- a there's a deeper base, story there. On a broader Tim, no, scale, Tim, Tim, all Tim, this in Cyprus here. sets a presence that's absolutely horrific because basically what they're saying is, okay, the bankers can go crazy. They can take all kind of risks, buy all kind of derivatives, and do all kind of insane things. And you're a depositor. Now, you don't own any stock in the bank, and you haven't right. lent them. Um, you know, you're not a bondholder. You're neither a, a stockholder or a bond owner. You're just a depositor. But we're going to take your money. Now, this has never really happened before. And now they're saying, well, we're going to take 80% or 100% of your money. Now, what a lot of people don't understand is the big corporations that loaned money to these banks, they're not losing a penny. The bondholders are not taking a haircut at all. No, no, not at all. It's just the depositors. No, here's what's going to happen. The, the banking industry, which is eight times the tourist trade, is gone in Cyprus. Oh, yeah. And the only thing they have to look in the future is the gas around the area, which Ru- Russia now is part of the deal. And you can see this is coming. 
wanted access to that gas field, and which was going to save Europe 40% of its oil supply, and wanted to have a port in Cyprus, which the Russians will get. other news here. One of them is that uh, the consequences of the banking system in Cyprus is gone. Any depositors in Europe that have large deposits of money must be nervous, and even in here in America. But I agree with Joel Skousen. I don't think anybody should be jumping to pull their money, because now that this has happened, the banks are even less remiss to pull your money or to do it. They might do something like, as John Moore says in his intelligence reports, they might do restrictions of saying you can't pull it out faster than a certain amount per day. But I think any kind of action like that would be met with such incredible resistance. What they do are doing, though, right now is with the Federal Reserve 0% interest policy they've had the last few years, they're eating away 3 to 5% of your money. If you're not getting interest on your money, it's going away. And that's a, in a sense Yeah, they're robbing tax. you slowly because when you put, if you put a million dollars uh, in a deposit uh, account, uh, maybe you, you put it in several different banks so you don't exceed the $200,000 FDIC limit, um, and you collect your uh, what other pittance they're giving you, that pittance is less than the true rate of inflation. So you're losing money. By keeping, right. and unless you're in a very profitable stock, and you also have to look at you know taxes you're paying, um, you're losing money in the stock market. Yeah, I got some other news. And, and that's and that's assuming that your your stock hasn't gone down in value, uh, because uh, it's it, what I'm looking at is the rate of return uh, on that investment minus things like taxes. And with the rate of inflation we have right now, and the true rate is uh, about three times what the government says it is. Yeah, it's between, uh, they say, between 7.9 and 11 percent is the real rate of inflation. Yeah. And the real rate of unemployment is about four times what they say it is. Yeah, the, the minimum is around 22 percent. The true rate, if you're looking at people under 35, is close to 40 percent. Yeah. yeah. So we're, and, we're, and also in, we're, seeing a, an, we're in, in a depression. Uh, right. that in many ways is very similar to the Great Depression. We don't see the long soup lines. However, you do see places like Detroit and many other cities that literally um, look like they've been bombed. And uh, things didn't look like that in the Great Depression. So right. you have yeah. some things yeah. looking worse, other things looking not as bad. Uh, and after all, there's, yeah. you know... Let, let me throw out a few more stories in here. Let me throw out a few more stories and get your opinion. We have U.S. now deploying B-2 stealth bombers over South Korea, uh, literally a kind of a counter threat. We have what's called bomber diplomacy by Russia over the last few months, running bombers over Diego Garcia, Guam, and Alaska, and the east and west coast of the United States within what are called bombing distance. So that's the Russians. We used to, since 1997, have PDD-60, which was put up under Clinton, which means that we will not have an automatic first strike, counter strike, if we are, literally have 100 million dead Americans from a first nuclear strike. That's not automatic. We don't have bombers in the air 24-7 like we used to have the B-2 up, literally, ready to just fly within a moment's yeah, notice. Yeah, but what we do have are, are one submarine, one boomer, American boomer, uh, carries enough warheads, and we can carry up to 10 per per SLBM, submarine launch ballistic missile, and I think we carry up to 24 per boomer per submarine. But the treaty restrictions, we, we generally keep the number of warheads, individually maneuverable warheads, down to about eight per missile. But right. essentially, one of our submarines, one of our ballistic missile submarines, has more firepower than all the weapons that were detonated in World War II. Combined, right, right. So now, we we now if 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 the madmen in Korea launch a war, and I don't think they're going to. I I, I don't think they're that crazy. Uh, I think they're they're it, it, they're very much connected to China, and I think there's there's all kind of games going on. But if it gets out of control, or somebody miscalculates, or something's really horrible happens, 
I believe, and this is not, uh, I'm not quoting you from a top secret document, but I believe that what we will do very quickly is shire the border area with uh, neutron weapons and tactical nukes. The border and, of which nation? Uh, the border of which in, nation? And this, is, this has come out. Deeper in, into the country, we're looking at about 19 hydrogen bombs. And well, well, okay, well, where, where are these going to be placed, uh, Tim? Where, where were you talking about putting the bombs? Where, where are they going to be? Well, uh, the, uh, the we'll use a lot of neutron I guess which bombs nations? and tactical nukes on the border area, particularly around Seoul, border. because they have so many uh, missiles and uh, <coughs> long-range artillery built into the caves and in man-made caves in the mountains just north of Seoul, which is the largest city and capital of South Korea. We have to take those out because they will destroy several million people within an hour. And I think we're prepared to do that. But right. as far as in depth, the study I read uh, one time that you know they're looking at about 19 large uh, atomic weapons. In other words, 19 hydrogen bombs. And uh, basically, uh, we will destroy North Korea on day one, and there probably won't be much of a day two. Yeah. Now. First off, it's not a one-way deal. Uh, what people need to understand is the North Koreans not only have their missile systems, which they, I think seven and a half years ago, they actually fired a missile over 120 miles of Anchorage. Yeah. But I'm, the fact is that there's a, a Chinese general that's the boss over Kim Jong-un, and the group of guys around him that actually direct it. And every time you show him, they show his buzz cut getting tighter, and pretty soon he'll be completely shaved on the other side of his head. <laughs> I guess maybe it's to try to make him look slimmer, but the fact is, this guy looks like he's just recently got out of a Tim Hortons donut shop or a place of fast food, you know, like Cinnabon or something here in America. Yeah, but that's it, in a country where people literally, they've lost 100,000 people to starvation. Right, so what we're seeing here is a situation where North Korea is being run by China. And China's playing both sides of this game. They're playing the game of, we build you iPhone, and we bomb you too, or we buy out Hollywood. You know, they want to basically, they have multiple tracks. We want to invade you, right? They want to do everything. So that's what's really going on here, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I, I, you know, Napoleon said, uh, Allah, let China sleep, because she's a sleeping giant, and when she wakes, the world will tremble. Uh, the overwhelming majority of all engineers and scientists alive today are now in China, and the number of students in China in engineering and hard sciences uh, far exceeds any country on Earth. And right. that's that's a bad sign long term. America uh, is deliberately being trashed. We're deliberately being gutted of our industrial capacities while the People's Republic is, is, is growing up. But we still have sufficient uh, military power. If push comes to shove, uh, we'll be the victor. Of course, then you go back to what President Kennedy said, and victory will be but ashes in the mouth of the victor. It's called a, it's called a Pyrrhic victory. Pyrrhic victory. Yeah. The old... Well, when you're all dead, you know, one guy, one carps can say, hey, I won. Well, okay. <laughs> It's like the last right. Viking standing over the body of his brother, and everyone in the battlefield is dead but the king. Not a good victory. Yeah, okay. Oh, you okay. are here. Good. Okay. Right. Uh, Chris, I want to get a quick update, and then uh, that uh, Tim has a lot more information he's going to post on the site, but I want to hear your update first. You've been doing the update, and by the way, in many programs, we have some excellent people like uh, uh, Arnie Gunderson putting up information. We have some journalists doing some pretty good work, too, but you're a nuclear safety expert, and you're actually currently in the field. So what we want to hear is that you've been doing some work for KEPCO, which is the Korean uh, people, and they're looking at basically the error 
uh, list of TEPCO and the continuing ongoing incompetence. We also see the incompetence and lack of action on the part of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in implementing things because many of these reactors are virtually identical in TEPCO in Korea, TEPCO in Japan, and here in America, sitting in areas of extreme weather, fault lines, or tsunami zones. So what have you learned and what are you telling TEPCO? What have you learned recently about radiation releases? Because my radiation detector is getting what I call brief and very sharp rises in radiation. They'll go from 45, which is about double normal, to 75, and then 20 minutes later it's back to normal. So there's something going on where there's radiation being re-released from Japan. It's coming in waves. We now know that there's a giant glob of radiation that was presented last week in New York City by Ernie Gunderson and Ruth, uh, what, what's her name, uh, uh, Caldecott. All these other do- doctors are dealing with radiation hazards in New York City. They're dealing with the disaster of Fukushima. And we want to get that map and post it up because apparently there's a cohesive glob of radiation that moves south of the Kiroshi current that's heading toward Alaska and the North America, including British Columbia, Washington State, Oregon, and California, and the Baja. This circulates across the Pacific, and by the way, it connects to every single major oceanic current on the planet. So within a matter of a couple of years, these massive radiation dumps, which occurred two years ago, are going to be in every ocean on Earth, including the Southern Hemisphere. People need to grasp this is not just a Fukushima, you know, too bad you Americans, you're getting blasted. This is everybody on the planet, especially the Northern Hemisphere. So what did you learn? Well, let's, let's discuss the uh, transport mechanism and why we're seeing waves of radiation. And I've got to go, I'm, I'm going to reiterate that I'm not the expert on, uh, on radiation, although uh, my, uh, I say my bailiwick is nuclear power plants themselves and the physical construct of them and, and the operation there to prevent any kind of a, a release like we're seeing. But what, what we, we, and we discussed this too was that we are seeing waves because the the ocean currents and the air currents are not homogenous. You know, these are they they are natural. You know, it's a natural um, a flow an ebb and flow. What we're seeing, so it's, it makes sense to me that it's not over and that we are seeing uh, continuous. I say call it action, continuous action um, of of the waves of uh, radiation that was released and what is still being released. You know, or radioactive right. material that is still being released. So. It doesn't surprise me uh, after uh, seeing uh, Caldecott and uh, Gunderson's you know, report. Um, let me go on to uh, so uh, you know how to stop this, how to prevent it. Well, we should have we should have nipped it in the bud way before then. We should have stopped it before it even right. started because that that would be the most effective approach. And to to segue into what what the Koreans, I know I keep on talking about what they're doing, but to their credit, they are very serious about taking action now to prevent such uh, an outcome from occurring in the, in the future by, by setting up uh, a command and control structure where people from the top down understand everything that needs to be done. This is not an easy task for anybody, but well, these, they are driven to ensure that only the, only the, uh, the most knowledgeable folks at the very top are going to uh, take action when it's necessary and not bicker uh, between... Uh, you don't have factions like bickering on whether or not to release the hydrogen like they did because they knew it was a full release system for hydrogen building up on the Taurus. Like the two groups that fought in, uh, in uh, Japan at TEPCO, uh, which, by the way, they knew that America was doing these hydrogen upgrades to the Mark I type reactors. We, we also know that here's the big problems I see with this whole issue. They keep dancing around. It's like the Faustian kind of bargain with the devil. You've got to change and upgrade these nuclear technologies to more current technology. You can't keep rebuilding old factories. Number two, you've got to get the radioactive waste off-site. Number three, you've got to protect your backup power, whether or not it's making sure you're above the water line or tsunami zone line. Because a lot of time they would have made estimates, oh, this is a century or a millennial tsunami. They literally lied to themselves and used a sharp pencil trying to tell them that they could never have a tsunami that big that would overcome their diesel generators. When they damn well should have known, you don't build a nuclear reactor in a fault zone, and you certainly don't underestimate a possible tsunami that could strike every century. So, and the third thing that I think has to be realized is that the first reactor in TEPCO was destroyed not by the tsunami, but by the earthquake. There were, there were also reactors on the other side of the island, in Oe and, and elsewhere in Honshu, that were also just damaged seriously. There was hundreds of tons of water released from a 
uh, a, a storage depot, one of the reactors on the other side of the island that was damaged. And people always want to focus on Fukushima. But the problem is there's a whole line of reactors running all the way up to Mount Fuji, and Mount Fuji's magma chamber is refilling, which means every two or three centuries, roughly every three centuries, Mount Fuji blows. And when it blows, it has a blast zone that kills everything within about 150 to 200 miles, and it causes a lot of damage beyond that. The fact is, when that happens, a super earthquake, a super tsunami is very possible because there's upthrust zones all over the area. And we're not just talking about cyclonic currents that carry it eastward toward America. They carry it over China and the South China Sea and toward Korea as well. So people need to realize that there's also currents that carry it in the upper atmosphere all the way from TEPCO in Japan across the equator to Australia. And they discovered you know, over a year ago there were major spikes in radiation that occurred months afterward in the west coast of Australia, the east coast of Australia. So the idea, there's a lot of premises being made here that they can just increase the command and control structure or they can harden the power grid backups and they can do all kinds of what I call window dressing. But they have to kind of take the bull by the horns and say, you know, we need to get rid of old technology. We need to not build reactors in danger zones. We need to upgrade reactors that are in danger zones to make them basically uh, natural gas generators that if it blows, you're not going to have a nuclear waste uh, depot that becomes basically a nuclear bomb. But we don't have that kind of action. In fact, the Japanese were even petitioning one of the companies in western uh, United States at the, in the Bakken to supply one company to supply all their gas is to convert all their nuclear reactors to natural gas. And the Obama administration under its green agenda actually blocked it. So what, when people hear these things, they think it's a comedy central joke that we actually made this up. We didn't. But when I hear this from KEPCO, I'm thinking they sound very Korean. But are they going to take bite the whole bullet? Are they going to actually do what's necessary so if a major superquake or tsunami or major extreme weather like the day after tomorrow happens, will they have nuclear integrity? And I seriously doubt it. I think they're going to be much more forthright than the Japanese. But look at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission here. They get rid of the old one because he's raising too many questions. And the new one is doing nothing. I don't see anything concrete happening that tells me that if we have a New Madrid superquake or up at the Diablo Canyon facility or even here in San Onofre, they're still dancing around whether they're going to let that reactor get turned on. And I'm going to tell you, I'm personally, well, many other people here in Southern California, we're going to sue their ass off for doing it. The state government, the federal government, and any parties, including the, the Japanese company that put these in two years ago, $600 million apiece that made these junk reactors and changed engineering designs and tried to not go through a relicensure process. So your comments, uh, Chris. Well, we have seen in the last uh, week or so an important piece of electrical equipment in Fukushima fail because it was, it was exposed to weather. Uh, a report came out today, as a matter of fact, as to what the root cause was. There, were, there was animal intrusion. And this yeah, type of yeah. the killer rat, the, the, yeah, the rat from hell that decided to kill itself by buying a, biting into a power panel on the back of a truck in TEPCO. That power Is that panel not... should not have been on the back of a truck, number one. It should have been, and if it was under a tarpaulin, it should have been uh, in, a, in a more sturdy structure. It, can't it should have been in a hardened floor. structure that could not be bitten by animals. Right. It should have been protected from radiation degradation of the wiring and the plastic because gamma rays and neutrons will destroy wiring and insulation as well. Amazing. What you're, what you're basically saying is KEPCO is trying to look tough and trying to be very Korean, but really they're doing window dressing. Uh, and TEPCO is having major releases. They recently just got, you know, have, had a nuclear buzz, bullet whiz past their ears. The con facility continues to degenerate and subside. We continue to have hydrovolcanic uh, releases of radiation. And we have a massive glob of radiation in a giant super high concentration that's actually moving in the uh, below the normal benthic layer across the Pacific Ocean and it's heading here. Uh, we also have radioactive uh, sea lions, radioactive tuna, 
you know, most people don't realize that most of the uh, sushi bars here in Southern California, there's nearly a thousand of them just from Los Angeles south to San Diego, just in Southern Cal. Their tuna doesn't come from the Atlantic Ocean or elsewhere. It doesn't come from, and by the way, have tuna farms in the uh, Aegean Sea. They have Aegean tuna, believe it or not. And from all the fancy tuna, they grow them in the Aegean Sea, which are clean. But no, most of the tuna is going to be coming from what are called radioactive waters because their playground is called Fukushima Daiichi. Yeah, They're literally Dr. off Bill, Sendai, Japan. You had on the West Coast, is, is it 1,000 or is it 10,000? I just read this uh, yesterday. Uh, sea lions wash up dead. Uh, and most well, and they're washing. Last they're washing summer. up dead because if you're a sea, what's the most? Uh, what's the best flavored fish that you can get raw in the Pacific Ocean? It starts with a T and it ends with an A. It's called tuna. 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 Tuna is not the top of the uh, food chain. Tuna literally breed in the waters off the off of southern of Japan, and they head over here to the to the Baja California. If you go to Ensenadas. A couple of years ago, you'd see these big, fat, giant sea lions. Now you see them shriveled up. You see them dead. You see them like, man, they don't look good. They they haven't been to the Sandal Sea Lion Resort. These tuna, these these sea lions are eating something that's killing them. Yeah. That's what's and going on. And it's yeah. coming here more and more. Yeah, exactly. Now, I, what people I need literally to grasp here is, am at the point where I believe that one should not eat seafood from the Gulf of Mexico, and that includes a lot of shrimp that's sold in America, right. and really nothing from the northern Pacific. Well, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that. I'll tell you why. Because you, you, you don't know specifically where it goes. What I think you should do is get an inspector EXP with a little arm and become a pariah and walk into your seafood shop or your restaurant or your grocery store and see if it goes click, click, click. And then uh, what you should say loudly is if it does go click, 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 said back away from the seafood. <laughs> so uh chris any closing uh, any closing comments uh, what words of advice would you have to you know i call government officials because they listen to the program because uh, they ask three things who's on deagle's program what questions are they asking and how, how do they know it what would you say to them, the guys uh, as advice? To be in, in charge i guess your folks who are in the navy and and perhaps other other branches i'm going to tell them to get qualified and that means uh Learn the systems that, that are crucial to maintaining safety. And in the case of Fukushima, that, that was an atrocity that they let that switchgear unit sitting out on the back of a truck under a tarp be subject. Let me put it this way. If you were to take a garden hose and spray down the breaker box for your house, would you expect everything to run after that? Probably not. Mm, probably not. Well, let's say you took a couple of buckets of salt water and, and threw it against your breaker box. Would you expect anything to run later on? I so don't need electricity throw to change. that way than use a hose because you might get fried if you use a hose. Right. Here's the thing, too. You also wouldn't realize you're going to need an electrician to replace the breaker box because it's going to be dead and useless and will never work again. Well, certainly they had to run a lot of extra power cable in, through areas that were re relatively inaccessible or very difficult to access. And so what you've done was you've, you've uh, exposed more workers to more, more dangers than that they needed to be because you didn't maintain something that was there. And then the regulators were supposed to be the watchdogs for the whole thing. They so didn't even know that that thing was out there rusting away for a couple of years. And so... That, that actually uh, limits the faith that one could put in a regulatory uh, body. And in my, my, in my mind, you know, they're just as uh, culpable as, um, as the uh, operator, which would be TEPCO in that case. And, and so right. really, who's, who's really, who's really guarding the hen house? Or does anybody, just because somebody's got a badge on and says, I'm in charge, they really know what in heck they're doing. No, uh, my, my general impression, having worked with the, the FEMA and the CDC, is that these people take stupidity to them an Olympic level. And uh, the problem is, if you're going to take those levels of responsibility for the lives and the future of America and the world, you got to take it more seriously. We don't see any action on the internal, uh, International Atomic Energy Association. We don't see the United Nations raising this issue. We don't see the, our government think being in a panic over the fact we've had two years of constantly being salted with radioisotopes. For example, they'll wear the pink badge, but the cesium-137 is going to actually 
cause breast cancer. We know that. The thyroid is now increased by 400 to 800 percent the number of abnormal thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer in Americans already since Fukushima. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't believe you about this, but I've sat down with three American generals uh, on the issue of a, a advanced biological warfare and what we can do to protect ourselves, and I came away just shaking my head like they really, really don't get it. Well, I told him exactly what to do, and this is 2001, six months before 9-11. In 1997, which is a few years ago now, that was 1997. You know how many years ago that is now? That's a long time, okay? 16 years ago. Now, here's what's going to happen. I expect an airborne plague to be released this year. I expect a bank meltdown to occur between now and next year. I expect the Mideast to blow up because it's already regional war. Don't say it's going to happen in the future. I expect Fukushima Daiichi, these earthquakes that are happening all over the place, to cause further major radiation releases of buildings and structures, not just at Fukushima but other nuclear plants, to further break down and cause more radiation release. I expect uh, before we before we end, I've got some information on, yeah. on uh, what the Saudis are doing. And yeah, go ahead and say it. Good. Yeah, but oh, yeah, okay. tell us what they're what, what are they up to? Well, which the, is always uh, not good. Yeah. The the Saudi uh, Prince Bardar bin Saddam, uh, their intelligence uh, minister, has been buying up all across Eastern Europe large numbers of a um, a rocket launcher system and the MLRS uh, rocket launcher system that the Soviets had made. It's a 220 millimeter uh, rocket system. It's it's a very nasty thing. It's similar to something we've got. I think ours is 230. Uh, it'll it can launch rockets uh, with any kind of warheads on them, uh, uh, up to 70 kilometers. Now they're going to use a large scale attacks uh, near the Turkish border. They've got a deal with Turkey. Uh, to bring these in. The recent uh, uh, meeting uh, with the Arab states broke up because the Saudis and the Qataris literally got into this fight. Uh, the the anti-Assad uh, uh, forces are fighting among themselves, the, even at the very highest levels. But nevertheless, the Saudis, with their big bucks, have been, are bringing in some very heavy uh, military equipment and is going to have a serious effect on the border. And if they're trying to take out a key area base uh, that the Russians are using to keep a resupply. The Russians have told the insurgents that if they do that, the Russians will ship in Spetsba forces and take control of that area themselves yeah, was, to protect well, well, the air base. Uh, now so the, that's, the, the, that's where we're heading. Michael Malouf wrote an article that's up in World Net Daily. You can, I'll have it posted up after the show. And that article basically says Syria is gone. And what he's really saying there. The Syrian military isn't the whole operation. It's run by Russia now. It's run by Hezbollah. It's run, by the way, all of these different alliances now. It's a regional war already. And it's not just a regional Syrian-Lebanese war. It's a Syrian-Lebanese-Russian war. Okay? So there, there's no such thing as, oh, if and we NATO. took out Syria, yeah, and NATO. If we just took out Syria, it'll be a cakewalk to take out Iran. Are you crazy? Do you understand there's Russian forces on the ground now? There's Russian generals and, and military personnel. There's technicians there. They brought in all kinds of weapons. Syria systems. is the back door to Iran, and, the, and all that is the back door to WW3. Right. And what, what I expect to happen in the next year or so, and this is another prediction I'm going to make, is that the Tayyip Erdogan is trying to make alliances with Israel and try to stay within the European sphere. The uh, government is going to turn and make a radical turn toward Islam. And the Turkish government will fall to radical Islam, and you're going to see a completely different situation. The major pipelines were finished last year, bringing Iranian oil to Turkey because they have none. What you just said, this, the, the Saudis are concerned about. Well, guess what? It's going to happen. And the Saudis are toast. They're just the dragons and their final billions of dollars spending like crazy, trying to see if they can bring this regime down. And as it says in the Bible, that Elam, which is western Iran, will burn the cities of the desert of the sea, which is the Red Sea. That is Saudi Arabia. Saudi is going to be toast. And Riyadh, get up now.